Well, I'm glad you're here today. God's glad you're here today. Be mindful again of those that are on our prayer list. Keep praying for them. And, um, <clears throat> just excited to be in church. I always start out like that. I can't think of a better place to be on Sunday morning than with you. Worshiping our Lord and Savior. I have so much to thank God for. The first thing I thank Him for always is that He loved me enough to die for me and then to rise again for me. I really appreciate God and love Him so much for that because I know for a fact that I'm unworthy. I'm unworthy of the Savior's love. I'm unworthy of my wife's love. And I'm unworthy of y'all's love. Really. But guess what? Because Jesus loves me. Lord, I just pray for that person that they're going to check on or take into the hospital. Anytime I hear that siren, that's the first thing I do is pray for those people. Um, But you know, Jesus loves me, so I now can learn to love. He's wanting to love you through me. And if I didn't have my wife in love with another man, I'd be in trouble. But because she loves Jesus and Jesus loves her, now I feel the love of Jesus through her. And now she can honestly love me. That's not what I'm preaching on today, but anyway, (laughs) praise God. I want you to take your Bibles and turn with us to Titus chapter 2. Titus. Chapter 2. It's right after 2 Timothy. (laughs) You find 2 Timothy, keep going to the right. You'll find it. Okay? Uh, Anyway, this is going to be the first installment on a sermon series, not back to back to back, but a sermon series on the church. I want to talk about today... And when I preach again on this, I will mention the name, a healthy church. Because God is not in the business of raising up sick churches. He's in the business of making sure His desire for every church, and I mean every single church, is to be a healthy, vibrant church. And I want you to know this morning, that you cannot grade or judge the health of the church by how much money they got in the bank. That don't work. Now, you can't judge or grade a church on it being healthy by the number of people that are in it. And you cannot grade or judge a church on its health by the programs that it has. Can I tell you how you grade a church and how you judge a church, whether it's healthy or not? This is how you do it. You look at the individual people inside and their lifestyle. Then you start getting into the health of a church. If people aren't living holy lives, the church is not real healthy. That's hard to say. Because it doesn't, I mean, I'm not (laughs) preaching to y'all. The Lord has already got me, okay? So don't worry. He gave me something to share with you because he had to take me out first. But I want you to know that it's the church overall. It's not the pews, but it is from the pulpit to the pews. In the lifestyles that people live, we begin to see how healthy a church is. And God is in the business of wanting, desiring, commanding even a healthy church. Now, in Titus chapter 2, I'm only going to read and preach from the very first verse. There is so much in this chapter, it'd take me at least 15 hours to even break through. You hear me? So be thankful I'm just preaching the first verse. All right, Paul says this to Titus, But speak thou the things which become, and you need to underline in your Bible, highlight that next word sound 
doctrine. Let's pray. God, this morning, we thank you so much for this beautiful place that we have to come and worship. God, I thank you for the body that's here. Lord, you've blessed us so much with a wonderful body of believers. It's not to say that we're perfect, Lord, but uh, we're beautiful because we're saved. And we thank you for that today. I pray today that you'd help me to speak truth from your word today. I pray today will be sound doctrine, Lord, that we've got to have inside the church. Lord, help us. Block our minds of the things of today or this coming week. Block our minds, Lord, of anything that would hinder your word speaking to our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen. I tell you what, y'all don't have to amen me, that's all right. I'm amen myself all the time, okay? But it's all right. I want you to understand why Paul's writing this letter to this man, this preacher named Titus. You remember on Paul's missionary journeys, he had several of them. He took a lot of trips, and along the way, wherever he went, get this, he planted a church. He planted a church in this city, and he planted one in the next city, and he just kept going. Well, this particular letter is going to Titus. Paul had been to the Isle of Crete. Y'all know where, most of y'all know where that is. It's in the Mediterranean Sea. He was there, and along the Isle, wherever there was a village or a town or a city, Paul was busy planting churches. And that's the biblical and the New Testament ideal for the church today. It's to not get so confound in one place, but begin reaching out to other places. Okay, and that's what we need to be doing. As a New Testament church, we should not only be ministering to the people here, but making sure people in every community, how big or how small it is, a church that is preaching and teaching sound doctrine. They need it. Because I tell you today, church, there's a lot of places today that are not getting sound doctrine. Uh, it's all about several things. First of all, feeling good. Everybody knows they want to feel good, don't they? Who wants to leave church feeling like a heel? <laughs> I mean, we, don't, we want to come and feel good and, and worship God, and, and we can leave after the message thinking, you know, that message sure was for that James Dale guy. <laughs> it's always good to feel good when you leave, or it's about prosperity. Hey, listen, church, we ought to go back and take the offering plates around. You need to plant a seed right here. You give us $100, we're going to pray God blesses you tenfold. You give to my ministry, and I know that God's going to bless you. I'm not going to teach you or preach to you a prosperity message. I'm not going to, I'm going to try not, with the Lord's help, to preach a message. I want you to feel good. I want you to be encouraged. But I want to tell you what, the Bible is all about correction and reproof and teaching us what we need to prepare for heaven. So, this is one of them messages, I guess. It seems like it's that message every Sunday. But Paul planted these churches, and he's writing a letter to Timothy, and he instructs Titus over in chapter 1, in verse 5, he says, For this cause left I thee in Crete. Okay, so now... Titus is the pastor, the, the leader over the churches there, that thou shouldest set in order the things which are lacking, he says. I planted these churches, but now it's time for you to get to work, and there's some things that are lacking, and this is one of them in verse 5. He says, you need to ordain elders in every city as I appointed thee. So this is the reason why he's writing this letter. It's not just to Titus, but it's to the churches. So the churches will know what Titus is doing and why he's doing it. He said, we need to start setting up some elders in the churches. But in chapter 1, I didn't intentionally skip over it. We're going to come back to it eventually. <laughs> okay. I just felt the need. I, the Lord led me to chapter 2. But in chapter 1, Paul's dealing and gives some pretty hard details about leadership in the church. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Chapter 2 to me is a whole lot easier to swallow than chapter 1. Because he starts talking about these church leaders. Man, he's got some pretty hard things in there. 
And it's hard in chapter 2 because in chapter 1, he is leaving the pulpit, and in chapter 2, he's going to the pews. He's leaving chapter 1, the leaders in the church, to the laity in the church. And now we're looking at chapter 2, understanding what, what is required, what Paul believes and what the Spirit's telling Paul that needs to be done. It teaches us the character of a healthy church. You're going to find some very specific, straightforward, and direct instructions in chapter 2. They're hard, okay? They're hard. But these instructions are given for this purpose that Paul will see that the churches in Crete are healthy churches. Now, I want to be honest with you. God is concerned with the health of the church. But we live in a time and in a culture where the people are fanatically all about the fitness of the body. I even thought about putting together a little sugar pill and advertising it, take this pill, and you'll lose 20 pounds in the first two weeks. People are so fanatical, they're hungry for anything. They're buying DVDs, they're buying books on all these things so that you can be physically healthy. And everybody wants to be physically healthy, right? It's not our intention to be unhealthy. We want to be healthy physically. But too many times we give too much credence to the health physically of the body that we go beyond, that we just ignore the spiritual health. There's a lot of churches who physically want to be healthy. They want to have big numbers. They want to have a big bank account. They want to have big buildings. They want to have all of it all. But they're little concerned about the spiritual health inside that church. But God is concerned with the spiritual health of his bride. There's one word in this verse that really stands out. I mentioned it to you just a minute ago in, in Titus 2.1. That word sound. Sound doctrine. And it's so important that it's used at least five times in the first two chapters of the scriptures in this passage here, in this little epistle. And the, the, the Greek word means literally to be in good health. That's what the word means in the Greek. So it's very clear that the Lord is concerned about a healthy doctrine and healthy living. You have to have both of them. If we're going to follow after Jesus and do it right. We read in the New Testament. I hope you read the New Testament. Do y'all read the New Testament? Well, dang, there's a lot of you in here that don't. I'll tell you what, if you read the New Testament, raise your hand. Really? Okay. I would say 99.9% .9 of you raised your hand and said, yes, I read the New Testament. If you read the New Testament and you read the epistles especially, and when you start getting into these epistles, this is what we find. It is a theme throughout and it keeps coming back and back and back again that it is about healthy doctrine and holy living. That's what it's about. And I want you to know this, church. I don't believe God, the Lord, wants to marry a sick bride. Because he didn't die for a sick bride. He died for a holy bride, a spotless bride. That's what he died for. And that's what he's expecting when he comes back uh, to get the church. He's looking for someone who has not only a healthy doctrine, because a healthy doctrine is here. It's in your mind. A healthy doctrine comes in here. And it doesn't stay there, but it begins to sink down in until it gets here. Because you go from healthy doctrine to holy living. What you read, what you hear, what you uh, believe is found here but when you start living it, it's done made residence in your heart. That is what he's talking about. We know that later on in this passage, Paul begins speaking to the older men and the older ladies. Then he begins to talk to the younger women and the, the, younger, I mean, younger, the younger men and the younger ladies. He begins to talk to employees. He said, what, well, employees? Yeah, he uses the word slave. In here, but that's an employee. 
But he begins to, to hit everybody inside the church. It makes no difference. And it, and it speaks to us and the character that God wants us to have in everyday life, in all parts of life, because you're not just you. You may be a husband or a wife. You may be a mother or a father. You may be a, an employee or an employer. God wants us to make sure that our holy living is in everyday life, throughout all day, every day of our life. That's what he wants. Because there's a lot of people out there who say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but they're cheating in the business world. That's not holy living. There's a lot of people who say they're Christian, but they're cheating in their marriages or in their relationships. That's not holy living. And Paul was really trying to hammer this home to Titus and these churches. So he speaks to, to every category of our life this same message. Sound doctrine, holy lives. I tell you what, let's say it together. Sound doctrine, holy lives. That's what we got to have. And that's what God's looking for inside of each of us. Now there in this passage and throughout Titus and all the other epistles, there's mandates and commands for every congregation to obey in order to be spiritually holy. Now preacher, you're starting to get into legalism. Really? Do you obey the law in America? I'm not going to ask you on the speed limit, okay? Because <laughs> some of us tend to stretch that speed limit on and out a little bit. Because I've seen some of you drive. <laughs> but listen, I believe God has set up a standard. For us as believers and congregations. He set it up. And if he set it up, then we need to follow it. Okay? Uh, because if we, you know, legalism, you know, Paul says this over the passage, I become all things to all man. It, it's not unlawful for me to do anything. Really? If we believe that, then just take off. If that's true, looking for an example without getting too hard. If everything's okay and, I, and there's no uh, command, uh, no mandates that I have to follow as a pastor, then that's all right. I mean, I could be married and have a girlfriend in 16 towns. I'm ministering to my wife's at home things. So. <laughs> but I mean, there's, there's commands in there for us to live holy lives, and he explains it very well throughout all the, the, the New Testament and even the Old, what it means to be holy. It doesn't mean for you to be a perfect human being, because even the vessel in which we live is not perfect. So I'm pretty close. <laughs> Joke, okay. I almost fell off the steps. The Lord talking about, yeah, I'm going to give you a push. All right? But I mean... The, even this vessel in which we live is not perfect. It's constantly dying. The moment you were born, you started to die. Now, these mandates and commands for every congregation to obey is there to make sure that we are spiritually healthy as a church. They're unpopular. Because they're complete opposite of what the world says. Completely opposite. And I, I'll be honest with you, I've talked with people in the past that, you know, and I just don't believe all that stuff, preacher. I said, well, <laughs> you ain't got to believe me if you want. I'm just telling you what's in the Bible. It's there. Now, you want to take God on with that? That's fine. That's between you and him. Again, I am just the messenger. And they usually get killed. But it was, it was Titus, his task, and my task, and every church leader in our church and in every other church to hold the church accountable for healthy living. It is our job. In other words, what are you saying, preacher? Well, I think that the leadership in our church, if somebody's living an unhealthy lifestyle, then we need to go to them and hold them accountable. That's the job. It's not that we 
We want to beat anybody over the head for whatever they're doing in their life that's not becoming the, the, the gospel and, and the word of God. It's that we need to do that to hold them accountable. Let me ask you a question. If you were asleep in your house and there was a fire and your fire alarm didn't work, would you want somebody to walk by your house and see it on fire? Would you want them to keep on walking? Or would you want to come banging on the door to come get you? Which is it? You need to make that decision. Because we need to make sure that people are walking in line. And it, that doesn't exclude any church leader from the pastor on down. You need to hold everybody accountable in the church. And the church holds everybody accountable together. Not out of hate. Like, you know, somebody does something wrong and you walk up. Hey, you doofus, what are you doing? But you come to them and say, listen, I love you. And I see this going on in your life. And, and, I, and I'm, I love you so much, I just don't want to see this be the beginning of a deep slide. And we want to come alongside you. Can we help you? Can we pray with you? What can we do? Instead of just taking a Bible and just, if I was near Jack right now, I'd probably hit him in the head. Why, what are you doing as an example? But that's not what God intended. We're to come alongside in love with people. And to hold them accountable. I've lost my place in my Bible. Hang on just a second. It, Titus is right after what book? Okay, just making sure y'all knew. Okay. Now this chapter is very straightforward, very clear, very strong. The opening verse that we just read, you can go down and read the, the closing verse if you like. But we see that God demands those who are in whose church? His church. We learned that in Sunday school. Very briefly our class did. <laughs> this is his church if you ever hear me say this is my church you need to correct me hold me accountable this is God's church not mine because I guarantee you if you say well you need to come to my church I'm going to say whose church it's God's church we need to make sure that we got that down but God demands that those who are in his church follow these patterns and, com and commands why does he address this through Paul well, you go back to the end of chapter 1, you'll see there's many false teachers. And folks, they're all over. They're all over. It may not be in, in the pulpit. It may be in the Sunday school room. Or it may be in the pulpit and not in the Sunday school room. Okay? And you understand, there, it's so easy for people to fall into a false doctrine. I read a story about the, some of the churches over in, in communist, uh, communist Ukraine before... The wall fell and all that kind of stuff. And there was a guy from America who went over there who was teaching a false doctrine. And he had something like 1,500 churches all teaching the same false doctrine. And somebody came along, grew up, read the Bible, and, and saw that it was a false doctrine. Stepped out and began calling other churches out. But it's so easy to get... To, to slide into false doctrine. Because why? Because people are not adhering to sound doctrine. They're open. James talks like this. He says that there are a lot of people who can be tossed to and fro. Whatever doctrine comes along, they gravitate towards that doctrine. That's why we got so many that are gravitating towards that prosperity message. Remember when I told you a couple of Sundays ago? No, preacher, we don't. I'll remind you. As, as, a, as you're witnessing to someone, it's hard to tell them, listen, this Christian life is great. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to suffer. Now, what's so great about that? I'd much rather hear, listen, I've become a Christian. All my worries are over. I can go out there and I can name it and claim it for myself. I don't believe in that. I believe that God is the one who blesses. And I believe he blesses those who are open up to blessings, and you've got to open yourself up. And how do we do that? We adhere to sound doctrine. We need to get on that doctrine kick, and we need to adhere to it and live it every day. But he's talking about these teachers. They're, they're deceptive. Uh, they get caught up in all kind of myths and human commands, and they're turning away from the truth. But he tells Titus and the church that a preacher or teacher is to hold fast 
to the faithful word over in chapter 1 and to exhort sound doctrine. In other words, it's not just to preach it, but it's to exhort others to walk in it. In order, in order for the church to be healthy, the church leaders will have to make sure that the confession of faith and the lifestyle match up. It's important. Because there are a lot of people out there who claim that they're born-again believers and have been for 25, 30 years. But you begin to look at the lifestyle and it don't equal don't match up and that's where church leaders need to be loving and caring with their people I'm not talking about just the pastor I'm talking about anybody in church leadership we need to make sure that their confession of faith matches their lifestyle he said well preacher that that's very close to getting to judging I don't think it is. That's the responsibility of the leaders in the church. And you hear people all the time. We have politicians and, and TV stars and all that, and they talk about, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I'm a born-again Christian. And you look at their lifestyle. <laughs> They're getting arrested over here for drugs. They're getting... They're getting uh, fired from their jobs because they're tweeting out pictures of themselves. And How would y'all like it if your preacher was tweeting out pictures of himself? <laughs> Don't send that tweet to me. <laughs> but I mean, for some of you, it's Facebook. I mean, you, know, you imagine seeing the preacher on there with his bathing suit on. Come on now. I'm not trying to make y'all sick or anything, but I mean, come on. It wouldn't be healthy. <laughs> and you say, you need to get out of here. Your confession and lifestyle ain't matching up, preacher. But when we leave this sanctuary Sunday after Sunday, Sunday night after Sunday night, Wednesday after Wednesday, Thursday after Thursday, we are representative of three entities. First, you're going out and representing God. That's first and foremost. That's why we tell our kids when they go to camp, listen, you leave this place, you're representing God first. So act like you're supposed to. Act like you represent the King of Kings. Secondly, you're representing your family. We know that we want to make sure that our family name is a good name and we don't go out there and take it through the mud and slander it and all that kind of stuff. So we represent God when we leave. We represent, <coughs> excuse me, we represent our family. But thirdly, you represent the church. You want to go out and act like an idiot? That's your business. Tell them you go to another church. <laughs> I mean, I'm just serious. So those three things. We are representing God, our family, and the church when we leave. Now, there have been some conversations as of late in the church concerning our culture. You think about this. And I'm not talking about just our church. It has happened in our church, but it, it happens in a lot of places and a lot of other churches. There's a lot of things, a lot of conversations that are concerning our culture. When you think about the killings, you think about the rioting that's going on right now, okay? We think about abortion. We think about alternative lifestyles. We talk about extramarital tragedies that are going on, fatherless homes, drug addiction, alcoholism, and the list keeps going on. These are a lot of things that are happening in America. And the problem is everybody's talking about, well, I just don't understand why all this is going on. The culture is rapidly getting further and further and further away from God. Why? Because sound doctrine is not being taught in the church. Church? We've got a culture in America that fatherless homes now is the thing. But we've got a government and we've got a media that glorify all these lifestyles. Why in the world do people want to worship athletes when they're, when they're nothing but a bunch of drug addicts. Our young people's heroes 
are these guys who are, who are strung out, who live a lifestyle that's, that nowhere near reflects the Bible. Our kid's hero needs to be Jesus. And if it's not Jesus, it needs to be their father or their mother or someone in the church to, that reflects Jesus. But it's a problem. It's getting out of hand. And many in church leadership, many in the church, they're more worried about their finances and how they're going to pay for a building or pay the bills than they are about the lost. Turn with me over to 2 Timothy now. That should only be one page for you, I think, I hope. Why is this happening? Very simple. Y'all ever heard the thing called the end times? Has anybody ever heard of that? Listen to this. Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, For the time will come when they will not endure, there's that word again, sound doctrine. But after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers, having itchy ears. Uh-oh. And I ain't talking about an itch like this. I'm talking about an itch where they want to hear something that feels good. About my lifestyle's okay. And it's the kind of that thing, I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay. Listen, if you're in sin, you're not okay. You're going to hell. If you are living in sin, we are headed to eternity without God. Verse 4 says, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth. There's that, might as well put sound doctrine in there. And they shall be turned unto fables. In other words, they're being drawn away by these false teachers and these false doctrines. That's how he put it. The same person who's talking to Titus taught Timothy as well. That we need to make sure that we are following and teaching sound doctrine. But the more we ignore and neglect God's truth, the further and further away we get. Until eventually, it's no longer just a little slope, but it turns into a drop-off. The more we slide, the further our society goes down and away from God. Paul is telling Timothy and Titus that we are to be morally pure. There's a, another epistle that Paul wrote. This is what he says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 22. You don't have to turn there. You all know it. Paul said this, and we need to get this in our head, church. If we're going to be followers of Jesus, if we're going to be a member of the church and we want to represent our family, Paul said this. He said, abstain from all, from all appearances of evil. He said, get away from it. Don't even get near it. Abstain from all appearances of evil. Don't even let people maybe even think that you may be doing something wrong. Everybody knows my story my, with my father, and I love my father dearly. But because of his situation, if I'm at the church, ladies, perk up, listen, and you come riding up here by yourself, don't be offended if I don't let you in. If you got a key to the door, you ain't got one to my office. I'll be in my office, lock the door. But don't be offended because, and it don't matter to me, your age or anything, and I've even had people that, that were even in the family who called me and said, I need to talk with you. I said, not without my wife here, you ain't. I do my best to try to make sure that there is no appearance when they see my truck sitting out here and they know that's a lady's truck, I want to get away from it. I want to abstain from all appearances of evil. They've even got them apple ciders and them champagne glasses. I won't even go buy it. I'll go buy apple juice. I can see me walking to Kroger with that bottle in my front hand. That's, about, hey, that's that preacher. He got liquor. He got champagne in his hand. Nope, I ain't doing it. I'm abstaining from all appearances of evil. And we need to do that. Man. We get into trouble if we don't. But there's something that God has done in our lives when we get saved. God has put into us an alarm system. Did y'all know that? And I ain't talking about your biological clock. I'm talking about an alarm system. Okay? And that alarm system, you can call it what you want, but what it does is it is warning us of unwanted 
entry into our life of any sin. I mean, it's like this. You know you do something wrong, and you're like, trying to kick yourself in the rear. Something comes on you and says, oh. Listen, if you do something wrong with sin, and you know you do it, and it don't bother you, you and I need to talk. But when something happens in our life, and if we sin or something, if it, you call it the Holy Spirit, we call it, I mean, it is the Holy Spirit who's convicting us. It's conviction. I don't know about you, but there's been times, and, and I know I'm the preacher in this little confession. You'll get to vote on me next year if you'd like to. You can vote me out. But I've let a word slip at that shop before. <laughs> First thing that happens, the Lord convicts me on the spot. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, God, I'm so sorry. I don't know how to let that thing, but, you know, that guy's really aggravating, Lord. I don't care how aggravating he is. You need to control it. You don't let anything slip out of your mouth. Now, that may not be for you, but it's for me. But that alarm system is put in us. It's the Holy Spirit who speaks to us and says, listen, you need to make sure you're watching it at all times. And, and I want you to understand this, because the people in our society and culture don't believe this. It is more important to do right than to end up winning. I tell you what, that drives me crazy. When people will do anything to win or be on top. Anything, it don't matter. So, but I want us to know this morning that we're going to come back to this over time. We're going to, yeah, we're going to go back to chapter one eventually too. Because <laughs> I'm going to tell you, it's tough. It is tough. And I know this message here is tough. It's tough for me. It's tough for me to preach this. And it's tough to, to hear this. And understand what God's wanting in a healthy church. But, and we're going to come back through time in different places. But if you and I want a healthy church, we need healthy people. Okay? So what does that mean? First of all, it means that we are firmly planted in sound doctrine, you and I. Not only are we planted in sound doctrine, but we need to be spiritually mature. We need to quit acting like a bunch of spiritual babies. Okay? We need to grow up. So what does that look like for us? A, a few closing thoughts here. First of all, it's a life restrained in an unstrained world. The world tells us if it feels good, do it. It's all right. Because if it feels good, it's got to be right. I mean, after all, God wants me happy, yes? No, he wants you holy. Okay? Secondly, follow Christ in a Christless world. Boy, I tell you, that's hard. We also need to believe right so that we will behave right. And we've got to stay focused on God in a world that is so distracting. I put one other thing in here. And this is not for y'all. This is for me, okay? So you take it and leave it. If it's to you, that's good. Put away childish things.